Blessed shall you be when men shall hate you, for the Son of Man's sake. Be glad in that day and rejoice, for behold, your reward is great in heaven. These words taken from today's Holy Gospel, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Please be seated. In today's feast, we celebrate the martyrdom of the great Dominican Saint John of Cologne along with all of his companions. The love of God that these holy men demonstrated through their courage and strength and the strength of their resolve is truly moving. And if I may on a personal note just say that, it is, that this story, the martyrdom of St. John fills me with a type of holy pride in a sense knowing that as a Dominican I belong to the same spiritual family as he. Over the past week, we had a, a men's retreat, and they were reminded constantly at every all of their conferences throughout the retreat to prepare a composition of place, which essentially means try to place yourself in the place that we're describing. So as I describe the events that took place with this martyrdom, I ask you to do the same thing, to put yourself there. Imagine yourself enduring, being one of the witnesses, just place yourself there. It was in the year 1572 that the inhabitants of the Netherlands found themselves in a rebellion against the dominion of Spain as well as against the authority of the church. In this struggle, the Calvinistic element in the country gained the control over the formerly Catholic government. Now, on April 1st in 1572, a group of Calvinist heretics known as the Sea Beggars conquered Brielle and other towns of the area. In the same year, Daltrecht and Gorkum fell into their hands. Now Gorkum is a little town in Holland on the Meuse River. It is positioned in the midst of a fertile country about 20 miles from Dortrecht. At that time, the town was in a very poor state with no sufficient means of defense. In fact, the only place considered safe at all was a citadel built on the town walls, which was built along the banks of the river. When the town was attacked, the Catholic inhabitants hoped it would hold out against the insurgents till assistance could be obtained from the neighboring cities that were still loyal to the Spanish crown. The Protestants of Borkum had, however, sent messengers to Dortrecht, which had just been captured by, the, by them, to attack the town without warning in order to eliminate the ability of the Catholic people of Borkum to send for aid. So as planned, on the morning of June 25th, 13 vessels carrying soldiers were sighted coming up the river from Dortrecht. They sailed almost to the very walls of the city. Upon seeing them, the Protestants had great joy but for the inhabitants who remained faithful to the Catholic Church, only sorrow and dismay. Now in the town of Gorkum, there was a monastery of 11 Franciscan friars. When the town of Gorkum was approached by the invaders, these religious took refuge in the citadel. They were later joined by the learned parish priest of Gorkum, Father Leonard Vetchel, and his assistant, Father Nicholas Jansen along with a few others, including two Normantines and an Augustinian. Father Leonard Vetchel and his assistant, Father Nicholas, had gone to all of the city, the citizens of Gorkum, begging them to remain strong against the Protestant heretics. They had visited the magistrates, made a tour of the city walls, and addressed the soldiers. But despite all this, the citizens failed to see their danger as the enemy had lied to them by proclaiming that they would tolerate Catholicism. The priests had barely reached the fortress when the heretic soldiers were secretly brought into the town by their supporters. As soon as they gained possession of the town, the leader of the Calvinist band, a man named Brandt, assembled the inhabitants and demanded that they vow eternal hatred toward Catholic Spain. All present consented with loud cries of support for this evil revolt, and then next Brandt proceeded 
to besiege the citadel where the priests and the religious were hiding. The place was very poorly fortified and the aid hoped for was not coming. The Protestant soldiers greatly outnumbered the Catholics who were in the fortress trying to defend it. So it wasn't long before the citadel fell into the hands of the heretics. Just as before Brent lied to the Catholics, telling them that if they surrendered, he would allow them to go free and unharmed, provided, of course, they turn over all of their valuables. While these deliberations were taking place, the priests and the religious prepared for the worst. They confessed to each other and then heard the confessions of the others. Father Nicholas had brought with him the adorable sacrament of the altar, and all were unable to communicate. When Brandt entered the fortress, sorrow filled the hearts of the Catholics as they saw how many of their fellow citizens had gone over to the enemy. They carried with them many articles plundered from the village churches, and now they came to demand the treasures they had thought had been carried into the fortress, fortress by the religious. However, when they realized that there was nothing of monetary value inside, they instead treated their prisoners with great cruelty. Crowds of curious spectators came to gaze upon them and shamelessly insult them. The captives remained silent, just as our Lord. After a day had passed, a day spent in mingled fear and hope, the names of the prisoners were called. All of them, except the priests, and the religious were set free. However, only after paying large ransoms themselves. There was one elderly priest in the group named Father Godfrey Van Duyen. He was also permitted to leave because of his age. But upon reaching the drawbridge, one of the townspeople asked the soldiers who accompanied him where they were taking him. He's allowed to go because he is a fool, answered the soldiers. Fool? the citizen said. He has wits enough to make his God in the Mass, and therefore he has enough head to be hung. When the soldiers heard this, they laughed, and they brought him back to prison. On the following Friday, although dying of hunger, the holy men refused to eat the meat that had been set down before them in mockery of their religion and the Friday abstinence. The soldiers, having the intention to vent their fury to the fullest extent upon their prisoners, decided to call them one at a time to ascertain from them the location of their possessions. After questioning a few of the priests to no avail, holding a pistol to his chest, they proceeded to question Father Nicholas. When he also said that he brought no treasures, they blasphemingly cried, at least give us the God which you made in the Mass. You who have so often railed against us in the pulpit, what do you think now in the face of this pistol? With the courage of a martyr, he replied, I believe all that the Catholic Church believes and teaches. And in particular, I believe in the real presence of my God and the sacramental species. If that is any reason why I should die, then kill me. I should be happy to die at the end of the confession of faith you desire of me. And throwing himself upon his knees, he exclaimed, Into thy hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. But his time had not yet come. Infuriated at the priest's resolve, a soldier snatched the cord of St. Francis from around the friar's waist and twisted it several times around Father Nicholas's neck, fastening one end of it to the prison door and pulling on the other. They violently raised him by his throat from the floor repeatedly. They continued interrogating him regarding his valuables. As he was choking, he could only answer by gesture that he had none. Finally, they left him half dead. The cord had left a mark upon his neck which remained distinctly visible until his death. The Franciscans were the next to be called upon. They answered flatly that they possessed nothing of the goods of this world, since the rule of St. Francis forbade them to possess anything of their own. They first went to the younger religious with hopes that they would be quicker to betray the place 
where the supposed treasures were. They were tortured in many ways until one of them, overcome by pain, answered with tears in his eyes that his superior was entrusted with the goods of the community. So upon hearing this, the evil men, not knowing which friar was the superior, instantly turned and grabbed the wrong friar. But the superior quickly presented himself, hoping to protect his brother priest from harm, and not wishing to have the crown of martyrdom snatched from him. They attacked him at once and tossed him backwards and forwards, demanding his possessions. When told that nothing remained of them, they called the superior a liar, but he answered not a word. He was then subjected to the same treatment as that of Father Nicholas, but with added cruelty. When the cord broke from around his neck, he fell apparently lifeless to the ground. And not being satisfied with this, the demonic soldiers pressed burning torches into his mouth and ears, then thrust them into his nostrils and into his mouth, scorching his tongue and palate. They ended by rudely kicking him and then left him for dead on the prison floor. After the soldiers had left, the religious crowded around him, looking at his wounds, they thought that he was dead. However, they were surprised to hear him sigh. They lifted him and washed his bleeding neck and his burnt face. Eventually, when he was able to speak, he said, I hoped that my good master would have received me into his bosom, but his holy will be done. The next morning, the soldiers returned with hatchets to hack his body to pieces. But finding him still alive, they just kicked him and beat him with their fists and rolled him upon the ground. For 10 days, the martyrs were subjected to this inhumane treatment. When one band of soldiers was worn out from torturing them, another arrived to take their place. In fact, even when the civilians came to visit the prison, they, along with the soldiers, devised new methods of cruelty. They did not even spare the elderly priest, Father Godfrey, who was decrepit from old, extreme old age. But despite his age, at every blow, he merely rep replied and prayed, thanks be to God. It was in the midst of these torturous days that Father John of Cologne, of the Order of Preachers, was brought prisoner into the citadel. Since as, a Dominic as Dominicans, we are today celebrating the feast of St. John and Companions, it is important that we understand a little of his background, along with his unique role with the martyrs of Gorkum. Now, St. John was a German by birth. His learning and sanctity, two qualities to be desired in every fire preacher, were remarkable. He belonged to the convent of Cologne, but had been sent as a parish priest to Horner, a town in the vicinity of Gorkum. When he became aware of the imprisonment of the clergy from Gorkum, he immediately obtained the permission of his superiors to minister to the wants of those who were deprived of all spiritual assistance. And in this lies the unique position St. John holds among his fellow martyrs. He chose to leave the safety of his parish to minister to the needs of his fellow priests and their flock because as a true moral God, he saw the extraordinary need of these souls and also understood understanding the principle that the good of souls always, absolutely always, takes precedence over the physical good. This faithful son of St. Dominic knew full well the fate that awaited him if he were detected. But like the good shepherd and a true son of St. Dominic, he was willing to give his life for his flock. Dressed in secular clothes to avoid detection, he would come from Horner to Gorkum to administer the sacraments to the faithful and the clergy who were being tortured in prison. This holy priest was especially zealous in baptizing the infants. On one occasion when he had been suddenly called to Gorkum to baptize a child, and just as he was about to perform this priestly function, he was apprehended by one of Grant's men. He was seized and imprisoned with the rest of the martyrs. The heretics falsely charged him with treason, saying that in visiting the city, he had hostile designs. But the real reason was because he, like the rest of the noble company, was a priest 
and a religious, because he was a Catholic and a defender of his religion. The treatment of the prisoners was so brutal that even the townsfolk were beginning to have pity for the priests and religious. However, before any real sentiment of mercy could be formed in the people, Branch transferred them to another heretic, one even more violent than he, the Count de la Merrick. Merrick immediately ordered that they be transferred to Brielle. Fifteen of the martyrs reached Brielle after a voyage of untold hardships. Arriving on the morning of July 7th, they were forced to march in procession through the town and around the gallows erected in the marketplace. The holy martyrs, like our Lord, were dragged through the streets amidst the mockery and the blasphemies of the bystanders. However, in the midst of this, they sang litanies, the Salve Regina, the Te Deum, and the Stavat Mater. The sufferings and the insults that they had to bear were indescribable, but the martyrdom was still not yet at an end. The prison of Brielle was a loathsome, uninhabitable place, yet these holy men were forced to stay there. And on July 7th, the Count called them to be interrogated again and ordered a sort of debate in which the heretics were put to confusion by the martyrs. And this only served to enrage the heretics even more. In the meantime, the four other captives joined them, namely the Dominican John of Cologne, the two Norbantines, and one secular priest. It was demanded of each one that he abandon his belief in the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist and the supremacy of the Roman Pontiff. All remained firm in their faith. Because of this, Marek ordered the prisoners to be hanged. This sentence was carried out with extreme cruelty. One martyr was hanged by his chin, the rope passed through another's mouth, and the third was strangled with difficulty because the rope was so loosely fastened. This is how the holy martyrs of Gorkum completed their final victory over the devilish Calvinist heretics. There were 11 Franciscans, two Norbertines, one canon regular of St. Augustine, one Dominican, and four secular priests. All martyrs of the Blessed Sacrament and for papal supremacy. The soldiers shamefully mutilated their bodies, cutting off their ears, their noses, and other members. They, the place where they were executed was filled with crowds of people for the whole day. The soldiers charged admittance for the people to come and see this gruesome scene. The evening of a, the, in that evening, a Catholic from Gorkum paid a large sum of money to be allowed to bury their remains. And God made known the death of the martyrs to Matthias Torum, a pious citizen of Gorkum. While saying his prayers on the morning of July 9th, he beheld in a vision this blessed band of martyrs clad in white garments with golden crowns upon their heads and resplendent with glory. A similar favor was given to another citizen of Gorkum, so that the martyrdom of these holy men was known long before the messenger arrived with the news of their death. Heaven bore witness to their sanctity by numerous miracles, and on the place of their torture, there, there sprang up later a most beautiful shrub bearing 19 of the fairest white flowers. The martyrs of Gorkum were beatified by Pope Clement X on November 24th in 1675, and nearly two centuries later, on June 29th, the Feast of Saints Peter and Paul in 1867, Pope Pius IX placed their names on the catalog of the saints, referring to Saint John as a great athlete of Christ. This Dominican priest is best known for the victory of his martyrdom. But it was his lifelong fidelity to the Catholic Church, lived out daily in the Dominican spirit, which prepared him for this final victory. In the times which St. John lived, Western Germany, Belgium, and Holland were dominated by Calvinist teachings. And as a result, many Catholics lost a sense of the reality and the necessity of living a sacramental life. Not unlike today, Many found moral absolutes hard to identify 
and faith was regulated to a practice of the ignorant. In the midst of these destructive currents, St. John held a strong foundation of truth, both intellectually and spiritually. And as a Dominican, he served 20 years as a parish priest, although there were no written records of the sermons he preached to his flock his final actions gave us the most eloquent testimony about his life, how to live as a Catholic, and the purpose of his priestly vocation. So as we celebrate the feast of these incredible martyrs, let us truly reflect on what these holy priests and religious endured for Christ, to defend every tenet of the Catholic faith, and ask yourselves if we would have the strength to endure such sufferings, or even more, would we be willing, like St. John of Cologne, who was in safety, to leave that safety and put ourselves into such danger for the love of God and for the love of souls? Because today we live in times even worse than those of St. John. And Christ needs generous souls willing to fight against this godless society, willing to give everything in order to gain souls for God's kingdom. Because although the world and the devil may chastise us with all the fury of hell, the devil will not have the last say. He can never take the glorious reward promised by God to the faithful who persevere to the end. And may God bless you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.